So, I am at a piano bar at my friend Lauren's Hendu in Islington, and I am talking to my friend Anne, who is Canadian. In fact, I'm having to bellow at Anne to make myself heard above the piano music. When a guy comes up to me and says, hey, where are you from? Now, it's getting on for midnight. I have been drinking since two. <laughs> I have no time for this. So I say, it's a long story, and I walk away. On my way out, uh, I bump into the same guy again, and once again, he comes up and he says to me, hey, no, you, really. I get the impression he wasn't entirely sober either. Really, where are you from? I heard your accent, and I'm really curious. Now, this is interesting. I'm what's called a third culture kid, which is someone who is raised in a culture that is different from that of their parents. I was born in Abu Dhabi, which is the capital of the United Arab Emirates, and my parents were Indian Bengalis, so I was brought up Hindu in a Muslim country, and I spoke Bangla at home and English at school. My parents insisted that I get the best education possible, and for them, that meant sending me to an English school. So when I left there at the age of 11, I sounded like the kids out of the famous five. I then transferred to an American international school, and by the time I graduated high school, I sounded like the kids out of Dawson's Creek. <laughs> I came to London to study at University College London, UCL, uh, when I was 18. Uh, and I've been here for 18 years, so I've come back to mostly sounding English, but my accent can travel back and forth across the Atlantic depending on who I'm speaking to. Now, at this point, the guy in the piano bar got bored and wandered off. <laughs> but I was approaching an epiphany, so I kept going. If I came to UCL when I was 18, and I've been there 18 years, UCL is the place I have been at most consistently for the whole of my adult life. I've been a member of staff as well as a student. So UCL is home. Now, when I was first asked to do this talk, and they told me that the topic was home, a line of poetry came into my head. You'll know from earlier, I kind of like poetry. The line was, home is the place that when you go there, they have to take you in. Now, that's a line from a poem by Robert Frost, which is called Death of a Hired Man. You're welcome to read it bearing in mind that it is exactly as depressing as it sounds. <laughs> but for some reason, that line had stuck in my head for all of that time. And I think it's got something to do with the fact that for the whole of my life, I have struggled to feel like I belong anywhere. Home is the place that when you go there, they have to take you in. So if UCL is the place I've been at the longest, if UCL is home, did they take me in? And the answer is, not entirely. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to tell you why. I work in a department called UCL Culture, and I am a museum curator. I curate the medical and science collections, and one of those is a thing called the Galton Collection. It's named for Sir Francis Galton, 1822 to 1911. Uh, just to get an impression, I can just about see most of you. Just by a show of hands, if you just raise your hand in the air, who in this room has heard of Francis Galton? I'm seeing a few. I'm also seeing that most of the people that I invited here are the ones putting their hands up. <laughs> okay. So, not that many people in this room. Now, that doesn't surprise me at all, because until I started working with the collection, I had never heard of Francis Galton. And the more I found out about him and how influential it turns out he is, a funny thing kept happening, or really the same thing kept happening over and over again, which is that I would find out something 
And I would go, hmm, oh, I never knew that. I guess they can't teach you everything. I'll give you some examples. Uh, Galton first became famous as an African explorer. He wrote a book in 1855, which is called The Art of Travel, and it's still in print. You can still buy it. And this book was so successful that it turned him into the Bear Grylls of Victorian London. So if you went back in time to London, 1855, said the name Francis Galton, they'd be like, ah, the African explorer. Now, if I say the word African explorer to you, you get a picture in your head, uh, which I'm going to assume is, ironically enough, a white man in a white suit, wearing a pith helmet, uh, in a jungle, looking off into the middle distance with a look in his eye that says, all of this is mine. <laughs> and that picture that you get in your head, that's Galton. And when I found that out, I thought, oh, I never knew that. I guess they can't teach you everything. Another example, Galton was the first person in Britain to publish a weather map. So what he did was he took data from lots of different places all around Europe, and he was the first person to draw lines between places of equal barometric pressure, equal temperature. So when you watched the weather forecast this morning and saw that it was a beautiful day, and the ideal time to come and secrete yourself into a very dark room and listen to people speak, <laughs> um, that's down to Galton. So again, found that out and thought, oh, didn't know that. I guess they can't teach you everything. One final example. Uh, Galton is the first person to demonstrate that the odds of two people having the same fingerprints is one in 64 billion. Now, that doesn't stand in quite the same way that it used to. Crime science is developing all the time. It's not an exact science. But that fundamental contribution that he made is the basis of our modern criminal identification system. We send people to jail on the strength of fingerprint evidence. Now, I never knew that Galton was responsible for that particular innovation in science, but I guess they can't teach you everything. All of that being said, the thing that Galton is really famous for, or it turns out not even a little bit famous at all, is the branch of science that we call by the name that he came up with for it, which is eugenics. Eugenics is the idea that through government intervention and scientific research, it's possible to breed better people. And Galton, that idea and the idea that science was what was going to help us obtain that goal, that is his unique and genius contribution to the wealth of Western knowledge. Now, he believed that the way to find out who are the people who should be encouraged to have children, pass on their positive traits, and improve the human race as we go on, the way to find out who those people were was to measure them. And so to that end, in 1884, at the International Health Exhibition in London, he set up what he called his anthropometric laboratory. Anthro meaning people, metric to measure. In the first year that it was open, nearly 10,000 people came to have their pedigree recorded and measurements of their physical features and abilities taken. Over the next 20 years, so many people came that it wasn't until the 1960s that there was a computer that was capable of handling that quantity of data. Now, at this point, I expect you're wondering, what's all this got to do with UCL? What's it got to do with how I feel at home there? The answer is what happened in 1904. In 1904, Galton wrote to the principal of UCL, University College as it was then, and said, the work being done by the anthropometric laboratory, this eugenic research, is important scientific research. It needs the backing of an academic institution if it's going to be taken seriously. The Senate of UCL jumped at the chance. They replied within a week, and within a few months was set up the Eugenics Records Office at number 50 Gower Street as part of University College. Within three years, it moved slightly closer to the main building up the road at number 88 Gower Street, and it was inaugurated as the Galton Laboratory for National Eugenics at UCL. 
eugenics, at its heart, is a scientific way of making a decision about who gets to live and who gets to die. And, like all of the other biological and social sciences from the 19th century coming into the 20th century, the idea, the scientific idea of race was fundamental to eugenics. Now, I spend quite a lot of my working life telling people this story, both students within the university and speaking to the public. And oftentimes, someone will come up to me and say, oh, this stuff is awful. Your job must be so hard. And they're right, but not quite in the way that they think they are. My job isn't difficult because of what I have to talk about. It's difficult because of who I have to talk to. This story that I've just told you, and so much else about the history of scientific racism in the 19th and 20th centuries, these stories are not canon. We don't get to hear them every day. We don't get taught them at school. I know I had a massive crush on almost every single one of my history teachers in high school, and I paid very careful attention to what they were saying. Never heard this story before. And when confronted with a story that you haven't heard before, sometimes people are resistant. To a certain degree, that's to be expected, but definitely something they need to work on. Other times, there are people who are devastated because here in front of them is a concrete example of how the world is so much stacked against them. And they're the ones I sympathize with because it's only very recently, and to my shame, that I am starting to learn more about this story. I feel their pain because it's a pain that I have felt myself. It reminds me of something my dad used to say to me. I'll say it in English to make it easier. My dad never said, they can't teach you everything. He said, they don't teach you everything. He didn't expand on the idea at the time. It might have helped. But I think the reason why he said it to me was because that he could see what was happening and what my education was doing to my mindset and the way that I see the world. He could see that in any random situation, it's much more likely that a line from a poem by Robert Frost is going to pop into my head than a line from a poem by any Bengali poet. Still, better late than never. Uh, I use my position and my work at UCL to try to get this story out there in as many ways as I possibly can. In the script, it says I am pleased. I am pleased to be able to tell this story, but what I really am is more determined to make sure not only that I keep telling this story, but that we all start to tell this and other stories more, because the more we tell it, the more we can move forward to a better place together. And what I hope I've been telling you is home is the place that when I got there, I tried to make it better. Thank you. <laughs>